Welcome everybody um, to this event this evening for uh, the Centre of, for Law and Environment at UCL. It's our first event of the academic year. It's wonderful to see so many people in the room. Um, welcome to those of you who are also joining us online. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, environmental law colleague and friend from the National University of Singapore, Jolene Lin. Um, who hasn't flown in specially, because that would be contrary to the spirit of the theme of, uh, of your book that you're going to be talking about this evening, but who is uh, visiting in the UK this year. And we, uh, knowing that, well, I insisted that she came and join us to talk about her latest um, exciting research project. But when she's not visiting, um, which is at the moment at the Centre for Transnational Legal Studies um, in London, she is based at NUS in Singapore, is director of the Asia Pacific Centre for Environmental Law, um, and is also helping run that law school, doing lots of good citizenship work, work in, in addition to writing books on climate change law. We're really lucky this evening because Jolene has done this fabulous project she's going to tell us about and has submitted a book manuscript. And we're going to get, I think, one of the earliest views of that material. The manuscript was submitted four weeks ago. Um, and so we're going to get um, insight into this work, which will be published next year. Um, so Jolene's work, uh, she's got an, an incredible body of scholarship around climate change law and policy in the global south and the role of cities in tackling climate change. Jolene's an editor of some of the leading environmental law journals um, and teaches climate change law and is doing that and transnational environmental law in London, as I said at the Centre of Transnational Legal Studies. We're going to hear about the new book project, Litigating uh, Climate Change in the Global South, which she has worked on for a number of years in a very efficient book writing partnership, as I've been hearing this evening with Jackie Peel uh, from Melbourne Law School. Um, and this builds upon an article they co-wrote together um, on transnational climate litigation, the contribution of the Global South in the American Journal of International Law. Um, and work you'd already done before that on climate litigation in the Asia Pacific. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you, Jolene. Thank you for coming. We are really looking forward to hearing about the work. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's always weird when people introduce you, not sure where to look and whether, how to look <laughs> humble and, and not look stupid at the same time. But thank you very much for being here on a weekday evening at 6 p.m. It's, it's peak hour traffic. Really appreciate you for being here in person. Um, I'm not, I'm going to take, I'm going to stand because I'm not, I think I'm a teacher at heart. I just like to stand when I talk. <laughs> so I would just uh, speak to, 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 about the book and I'll speak for about 40 minutes and that would leave well, us plenty of time for some questions and answers and would love to hear your comments and clarifying questions and controversial questions too. All right. So basically as, um, so the, I'm going to, well, as, as um, Olise has mentioned, um, we, uh, this book is written by me and uh, Professor Jacqueline Peel at the University of Melbourne. Um, we decided to write this book together because, and I'll tell you more about the why we came to this book, but as you can see, there is no book cover because we submitted the manuscript four weeks ago. And so all I have is this to show. <laughs> um, but I will hope to see the book eventually in a few months time, hopefully. Okay, so I want, I want, I'd like to share why we decided to write this book. The first things first is that we discovered that throughout our teaching and through our research, there was a real gap in the academic scholarship on climate litigation. And the gap was, why is there no, not a lot written at all about climate litigation outside the European Union, the United States, Australia, and a couple other developed countries? Well, the short, simple answer to that would be simply be, because there's no climate litigation, therefore nothing is written. But we were not comfortable with that answer. And what it began as an in, in, in initial intuition became our working hypothesis. And that hypothesis was that we think there must be climate lawsuits being filed elsewhere, but they were not being picked up by the media, not being picked up by academics. And so what the, and the question is would be why? And, I, and, and we wanted to also kind of shed a light on what was happening if it was happening. And that was the very purpose of this book. And we also felt thought that as part of this working hypothesis is that climate litigation 
in the global south or in the developing countries may not be, be picked up as climate litigation because these lawsuits don't bear the characteristics of climate litigation that we often uh, associate with climate litigation in the developed countries. And I'll speak more about this later. So what happens is that this book, as I mentioned, is built upon, as oh, so I mentioned, as Eloise has mentioned, mentioned. Yes. built upon um, an article that we co-wrote and was published in 2019 in the American Journal of International Law. And in this initial stab at trying to look at cases in the global south, we only managed to look at 34 cases as our, and in our, this tiny database that we had. But in this book, we managed to look, examine 128 cases. Now, this is explained by a number of factors. First, there has been a tremendous growth in climate litigation, particularly in the global south, in the period between 2019 and the middle of this year. Secondly, we have, of course, improved our data collection and learned to be much better at trawling the internet as well as speaking to people and the networks. And this is also a, a third point that was really important. The ability to identify relevant cases was greatly heightened because we had the support of the, this increasingly dense collaborative networks that can be described as giving rise to what we call a global climate litigation community. Now, this 128 cases um, do not include the growing number of cases with what we call truly transnational dimensions. For example, cases that are being filed in Europe by a coalition of NGOs challenging fossil fuel projects in Africa. The, they are not considered part of our 128 cases because they are not being filed or decided in courts in the global south. Secondly, we also do not include cases or advisory opinion proceedings in international tribunals. So this is 120 cases purely focusing on cases that are being filed and decided in courts in the global south. Where is climate litigation happening in the global south? We look at three main geographical regions of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And here are the countries where climate litigation is happening. India, South Africa, and Brazil are highlighted in red and bold. This is because in each of these geographical regions, the, the, these countries are what we call the front-runner jurisdictions. In these countries, the highest number of cases have been filed and decided in this geographical region. And we devote a chapter looking at, uh, taking a close look at the opportunities and barriers for litigation in India, South Africa, and Brazil and try to understand why these places were, had become the jurisdictions where climate litigation was growing. It's also important to recognize, and this is something that we do in our introduction to the book, that the global south is a, sh it's a shorthand that we use to refer to a group of countries that traditionally within the international climate change negotiations are referred to as the non-Annex 1 countries, but then it doesn't really capture a very good um, understanding of what these countries are. But when we look at the global south, what's happening is litigation is happening in a very small subset of countries. These countries are often referred to as the middle-income countries. Um, these countries face very similar challenges where they are trying to maintain sustainable economic growth, there's conflicts between the priorities of economic growth and environmental protection, and there's also issues of income equality, etc. But what's important is that they have institutions that are good enough to encourage citizens to go to the courts to seek redress. I'm going to give some examples of what climate litigation looks like, uh, what, of some cases that are happening or have been decided in the global south. The first one that I want to talk about is Lahari and Pakistan, which was decided in 2015. 2015 was a watershed year in terms of climate lit litigation. It was the year that Ahenda and the state of Netherlands was decided. But while Ahenda had global headlines and so much global attention on it, um, 
Lahari and Pakistan, which was actually more far-reaching in its results and remedies, barely got a murmur. Nobody had heard of it, except perhaps a couple of people. So what is the Lahari and Pakistan about? Um, the case was brought by an environmental lawyer who also is an agriculturalist. He brought this case challenging the government's failure to properly implement the national climate change policies. And the, the allegation was that the failure to implement these climate policies constituted a, an infringement of his constitutional right to life, right, uh, right to the dignity of the person, and right to property. The Lahari, the Lahore High Court ruled that the governmental failure amounted to a constitutional violation. The presiding judge, Mansur Ali Shah, de described climate change as a defining issue of our time and grounded the decision in constitutionalism as well as international environmental law principles. Now, what's interesting about Lahari is the remedies and results. First, La Judge Mansur Ali Shah directed all relevant gov government agencies to nominate a focal person to work with the Ministry of Climate Change. And this was because on the witness stand, the representative for the Ministry of a Climate Change said that it was impossible to implement the policies because no one from the other agencies wanted to talk to him. That's a problem. So the second thing was that the judge sought to establish an expert climate change commission. The role of the commission was to assist the court in monitoring the government's progress in implementing the said climate change policies. And finally, three years after this case uh, was filed and decided, the court and the expert commission agreed that the, all the remaining issues on the commission's agenda had been implemented or could be implemented within a, a, a suitable timeline, and therefore the court uh, dissolved the commission. And this is rather extraordinary, and I could say, talk a little bit more about that later, but is this idea that in Pakistan, as a result of a history of an activist court, has had a history of the writ of a continuing mandamus, where the court maintains a continuing watch on the implementation and enforcement by the government of court orders. Another case that I'll just briefly mention um, is the Tabometsi case. This is the first case that was uh, that was the uh, first successful climate litigation in South Africa. Just very briefly, it's a classic judicial review of the minister's decision to award an authorization for the construction of a coal-fired power plant. And the, the judicial review, the argument was basically that the minister had acted irrationally by not taking into account climate change considerations in deciding to allow this coal-fired power plant to be built. And the High Court agreed and, uh, and, and found that the minister was obliged to consider climate change impacts but failed to do so. In this case, there was, this case itself was also accompanied by several other lawsuits. So there was litigation on multiple fronts. And as an example of strategic litigation, the Tabamatsi case is a good example of how the litigation itself, while it may not have secured the outcome that they wanted, because eventually the, lit the, 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 lit the, the, the minister was, was allowed to reissue a decision and the decision was that if the, the project was sound and that climate change considerations were taken into account, but other considerations trump climate change. The, the strategy here was to accompany the litigation with a major um, advocacy campaign. There was community mobilization, there was shareholder activism, there was pressure on the international as well as uh, domestic banks. And eventually, the Tabamati decided not to go ahead with the project, even though they had secured the licenses because they had no license, social license to, proceed, to, to act. I'm not going to uh, share an example of a transnational case. It's a case that's not included in the Global South docket, the 128 cases, but we think it's really interesting and represents 
what we think of as an emerging pathway for climate litigation. Asmana and, um, and, and, and et al. versus Holcim. So on 1st February this year, four Indonesian citizens who live in an island called Pari formally lodged a lawsuit in Switzerland against one of the world's largest cement and construction materials company. That company is a Swiss company called Holcim. The plaintiff's request that Holcim reduce its carbon emission reduction, uh, emissions, that Holcim co-finances adaptation measures on the island of Pari, that Holcim pays for loss and damage because of its role in the climate crisis, and finally, that Holcim pays damages, it pays compensation to these four citizens. Asmana and the other three litigants rely on a study by the Climate Accountability Institute, which establishes that between 1950 and 2021, Holcim released more than 7 million tons of carbon dioxide. This amounts to 0.42% of all global industrial carbon dioxide emissions since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So you, if we bear in mind this idea that its share of global emissions since the start of the Industrial Revolution is 0.42%, this explains why the plaintiffs seek a small amount of US $3,600 each as compensation because what they did was to calculate this amount on the basis that if Holcim was responsible for 0.42% of the global climate uh, crisis, it would pay compensation proportionate to its role in causing climate change. As you can see, this, well, Holcim has basically argued that it has no case to answer, and that's why it would go, it has, it, the, the, the proceedings have, have uh, entered into a former stage. Um, as you can see, the amount of damages is not great, but it is the value of the precedent that, is, um, that makes people interested in what this judgment has to say about climate justice and the possibility for um, inhabitants in the global south to seek um, compensation from um, major carbon intensive businesses that are located or domiciled in the uh, developed world. Okay, I'll speak a little bit about the, the cases that we looked at. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about methodology, but it's, I just want to explain what cases we include and what cases we exclude. So we include cases which we call core cases, where arguments raising issues of climate law or climate science are central to the pleadings or to the decision by the court. We include peripheral cases where climate change arguments may be made alongside other arguments or, or, or climate change is one of a number of issues raised in a dispute. But what we exclude are incidental cases where climate change is mentioned by, by in passing. And the question of motive, um, do we include cases which do not mention climate change in the submissions or in the judgment or any of the other legal documents, but we know that these cases are being filed with the intention to change the law, the policy, or to change public perceptions about climate change. So the idea of we know means that perhaps we have conducted interviews and the um, um, interview, in, interviewees have shared that that was the motivation. And we decided eventually to exclude these cases because it was not possible to triangulate the, 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 the data in that sense. And because in the literature, there's a lot of controversy about in using motive and intention as the basis for including all cases in as climate litigation. We coded the cases for a number of variables. We wanted to know who was being sued and who were suing. We wanted to know whether the case was a core or a periphery case. Um, we wanted to understand what were the legal avenues being pursued. 
We wanted to understand whether the public trust doctrine was, uh, was often resorted to, what kind of arguments were being raised, and whether the Paris Agreement and national climate change laws served as a basis for bringing litigation. And when I say coded, it sounds very, you know, it sounds very technical, but it just meant that both of us just poured over lots and lots and lots of paper. Um, this is a, 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 a table, and I, own, I think the most interesting role is actually the bottom one, which tells us that out of 128 cases, there are more periphery cases in the global south than core cases. But because of this, I mean, in numerically 70 or, and versus 20, 58 gives us a very um, small percentage difference because of the small number um, of the data set. But basically what we see is that there are more periphery cases than core cases. And this is, and this is something we try to explain um, uh, in, in our book as one of the characteristics of climate change litigation in the global south. Rights-based litigation is a significant characteristic of climate litigation in the global south. There, are, there has been a, there's a significant number of cases which rely on um, constitutional rights, such as the right to a clean and healthy environment. Um, who are the actors? Uh, we devoted a chapter in to, to examining who are the you know, actors involved in bringing cases and enabling uh, climate litigation in the global south. And here we looked at six uh, different actors and they all play slightly different roles. But what's interesting is that um, as to be expected, um, about three quarters of the cases are actually filed by NGOs. Um, civil society has always played a key role in in using the courts to advance uh, environmental protection, so that was not unexpected. We saw a role for philanthropy, where funders were beginning to were, were helping to um, provide the financial and 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 technical resources uh, to 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 um, encourage uh, uh, climate litigation. When we talk about lawyers, we uh, we are we're interested in the role of lawyers, as in what role they play, whether as um, whether they as as part of the NGOs or as advisors to the litigants. And of course, we saw a significant uptick in the number of cases being filed by youth um, plaintiffs in the last couple of years as, as part of a global trend. And also, indigenous peoples uh, were beginning have been more active in filing cases. We decided to to kind of. We were, we, were, we were having looked at all the different actors. We were interested to try to understand whether there was sort of a dominant mode of climate litigation coming uh, that, that emerges from looking at the various actors involved in the space. And we basically came up with this typology referring to five, you know, kind of five characters: the grassroots activist, the hero litigator, the farmer, the engineer, and the enforcer. And I'll speak to some of it. The grassroots activist is referring really to the role of domestic slash grassroots NGOs in bringing cases to advance climate justice. Um, contrary to expectation, a lot of people think that every single case in climate litigation must be brought by a big and well-resourced global NGO, um, but actually it's not the case. Particularly in India, uh, we found that um, almost close to 95% of the cases were brought by domestic NGOs, or grassroots NGOs. Um, the grassroots activist basically refers to these grassroots organizations who may work uh, in coalition. And increasingly, we see that um, thanks to social media, thanks to um, increasing networks, increasingly growing networks, um, these grassroots activists are also uh, partnering up with um, bigger NGOs, uh, whether they're at the regional level or the global level, to, to share resources and, and to actually strategize uh, on uh, 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 and, and, uh, how they bring cases and what kind of cases they bring. The hero litigator is referring to the litigator who tends to be sort of at the forefront of the campaign. And the pers a, a person that comes to mind is uh, Melinda Jenke, 
who is a, a, a activist slash environmental lawyer in Guyana and who has single-handedly brought several cases challenging the award of offshore oil drilling permits by the Guyanese government. It also helps that she drafted most of the laws um, 20 years before uh, as, as a consultant to the government. And so she loves the idea that she is now turning against it and using and saying that she now is properly enforcing the laws she drafted. Mm -hmm. And she's a hero litigator. She's very much the face of Guyani's uh, uh, climate litigation. She speaks to the media. She has a very powerful presence. Um, she, she, she builds an entire social media campaign around the, the cause, her cause as she calls it. The farmer is really looking at um, the role of organizations uh, such as um, major NGOs and philanthropy uh, organizations that try to seat climate litigation in places where they think um, it would benefit um, the quest for um, climate justice and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the engineer, when we talk about the engineer, we had in mind the role of organizations that have hit upon what they see as a very successful case strategy. And they seek to engineer the replication of that success across various countries. Um, we have seen that in the developed countries. So Ahenda versus, um, sorry, Ahenda and the state of Netherlands, as I mentioned, was a very successful case. And the lead lawyer, Robert Cox, wrote an entire manual of how to replicate a hender in your jurisdiction. And guess what? Robert Cox will be more than happy to assist you together with his team of passionate environmental lawyers. That's the engineer. We have not seen the equivalent of that in the global south. We were actually quite pleased to see that instead of the engineer at work, we saw that there was a lot more attempts when global activists or act, uh, global um, and, uh, actors try to encourage climate litigation or see there is a role for climate litigation. It's much more a role of partnership and cooperation and a lot of input of local knowledge in even deciding whether you should proceed with a case. Because in some places, proceeding to sue a state-owned company may not be a very sensible thing to do. Mm. And finally, the enforcer. Enforcer is really referring to the uh, regulators and the prosecutors that are bringing climate cases. Now, what we really have in mind here, and which uh, we, we elaborate a lot about in the book, is the role of the prosecutor in the Brazilian uh, 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 criminal justice, sorry, in the Brazilian legal system. The prosecution service in Brazil is a very lauded uh, institution and has unique uh, characteristics that allows it a high degree of independence, which is actually enshrined and protected by the constitution. So what we see is that a, quite a lot of the cases in the Brazilian uh, uh, docket are filed by the prosecutors. And in fact, today it was reported that the prosecutors in the state of Pará have already have filed three lawsuits um, against carbon offset projects in the Amazon because, ta-da, these projects have, are now questioned as to whether they are legal because land that the carbon offsets have been generated from will actually affect public land. Um, so the enforcer here, we also see that in Indonesia where um, the prosecutors have played a role in prosecuting offenses such as deforestation or illegal mining. And the climate angle comes in because of the remedies they seek. They seek that the, um, the, that, that the uh, defendant will have to compensate, not just for the damage done to the environment, but also carbon, the loss of carbon sequestration ability of the land and to restore the carbon sink. And so it's actually really interesting there how different, uh, uh, the different angles that the prosecutors um, look to. Um, it doesn't come as a surprise that the conditions supporting the emergence of climate litigation are generally the conditions that support environmental rule of law, okay? access to justice, 
just, uh, judges who are receptive to climate arguments, that there is the legal stuff. There, there is environmental laws and, there's, and, and climate change laws to a certain extent that allows the litigants to actually ground a case in. Constitutional protection of the environment also is an important um, ground that is advanced in global South climate litigation. And of course, an active civil society um, to, 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 to build the um, public support as well as to bring the cases themselves. Um, I mentioned earlier that we talked about what makes climate litigation different in the global South. And um, Jackie and I decided that it would just, it's not possible to say, this is what's happening in the global North, this is what's happening in the global South. That just doesn't make sense. In fact, what we just see is a spectrum, and we kind of use it as more like a, like a, a, a what we call it, you know, kind of intellectual framework to kind of understand what's unique about what, what's unique about what we're studying in climate change litigation in the global South. So we're gonna, I, I would, we argue that there are three main characteristics that stand out to us. First is the prevalence of rights-based claims. We're not saying that rights-based litigation is not on the rise in the global north, because it is, but we're saying that when we look at the 128 cases, what is really stands out is the prevalence of rights-based claims. And that's because many of the constitutions of these global south jurisdictions contain environmental rights. We also see that the vast majority of cases seek enforcement of laws that already exist on the books, rather than cases that seek to challenge the government to adopt more ambitious climate policies. And finally, what we, talk, we call stealthy climate litigation. We see that the litigation in the global South jurisdictions tends to be about trying to advance quite cautiously, quite quietly, by packaging climate change issues with what is deemed as less controversial claims. Why is it less controversial? Because in some jurisdictions, climate change is a highly politicized issue. And also, in some, in some jurisdictions, the courts will refuse to entertain a case on the basis that climate change is a political issue. And so, stealthy climate litigation is referring to the idea that um, you kind of package climate change or you, uh, with other issues that may also be more relevant to that jurisdiction. So for example, uh, when we interviewed um, NGOs who had brought um, several um, climate change lawsuits in Bangkok, um, they said that, well, climate change is an issue, but poor air quality is also an issue that people care about. And there are, these two issues are of course correlated, um, but that's also how we would package the case and advance the case as an issue of both about climate change and tackling air pollution. Impact. So after talking about all that, we ask ourselves, so what? So what have all these cases have been brought? Have they done any good? Is it just, have they actually advanced climate action? So when we talk about impact, we basically um, will explain what is our way of assessing the impact. First of all, there are several disclaimers. Okay, so first, many of the cases were filed fairly recently, right? Lahari, for example, was filed and decided in 2018. So we're not going to be able to have a very a detailed, a very long time frame to assess impact. Secondly, is that um, we are, uh, impact is something that we think is best understood as a qualitative assessment, taking into account the local circumstances. Because what is success, what is, do we understand to be success, has to take into account what is actually feasible and doable and achievable in that jurisdiction's context. So what we did was we took a couple of cases and we looked at what were the direct impacts of the case? What were the indirect impacts? What were the material impacts? What were the symbolic impacts? To try to determine whether a case was deemed impactful. Did it actually achieve what the litigants hoped it would achieve? Um, when we talk about direct impact, that's obviously the, the, the one thing that everyone focuses on. It leads to legal change. It leads to changes in the regulations. 
When we talk about indirect impact, we're talking about changes in the attitude of key actors. What does it mean? For example, it makes companies more aware that if you want to go forward to finance a coal-fired power plant, be prepared for people coming up to you and asking, why did you finance this coal-fired power plant when we all when when the science and the economics show that it's likely to be a stranded asset? Things like that. We also identify what we see as future areas for development. Now, what is interesting is that out of the 128 cases, a mere handful of less than 10 address adaptation. And yet, the global south is where the brunt of climate change impacts will be experienced. So what we think is happening is that there is a lot of emphasis on mitigation because a lot of the policies at the moment that have been enacted are focused on mitigation. Adaptation tends to also be highly localized, and so the lawsuits may also be lost in our data collection. This is something that we are thinking about, actually. But what we see is that we think that our future area for development must be um, cases on adaptation and increasingly loss and damage in line with the negotiations that are happening right now or at least at the glacial speed that is happening right now. We see that a future area for development will be cases that are being filed by indigenous peoples because many, as, as, for example, especially as carbon markets grow, several projects will have, are likely to have impact on indigenous peoples' rights. Um, for example, the failure to consult them before coming up with these brilliant carbon offset projects uh, that end up selling these credits to multinational corporations. We also think that what would be interesting as a few, and, and what we think would be a future area for development would be cases seeking accountability of corporate actors. The vast majority of, corp of cases in the Global South docket are against governments, whether it's the federal government or state government. Very few cases have been brought against companies. Cases that have been brought against the companies are usually cases brought by the regulators, prosecutions for environmental offenses, that sort of thing. But we think that, obviously, cases like uh, 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 the case against Holcim will be an interest, will be a pathway for cases seeking accountability of corporate actors. And this leads me to my last point, which is transnational cases. Transnational cases the term basically refers to the idea of cases being filed by citizens living in the global south, challenge uh, and, and the, filing these cases in the global north and seeking redress there. And we think that that's going to be really um, an interesting space to watch. And on that, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and your whole attention. <laughs> Jolene, thank you so much. Before I open up for questions, I think there's a reason why you're here tonight. Melinda Janke, she did her undergrad at UCL Law. That's right. So there you go. That's a nice squaring of the circle <laughs> of your hero litigator. Um, so we're now um, going to open up for questions. There was so much in that, full of insights, absolutely fantastic work. I feel very privileged that we've been the ones to be able to hear about it very fresh from the finishing of the writing. Who would like to ask some questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> we have a question at the back. And just wait, the microphone's gonna come around so the people online can hear the question. Thanks very much, that was very helpful. Um, I have two, two cases. You mentioned that a lot of the cases are rights-based because um, in the Global South, a lot of the constitutions have environmental rights. But is there any element of the um, the people bringing the case, the, the nature of the people bringing the cases, causing them to be rights based, possibly? Yeah. Um, and then the other one is you said that um, there's space for future development on corporate accountability. Uh, but to what extent did the corporates factor indirectly in the existing cases. 
Sorry, can you repeat your last question, the, la the last bit of the question? I didn't catch that. To what extent did corporates figure indirectly in the litigation that you that you reviewed? Because okay. you said most of them were against governments at this stage. Yeah, thank you. I think, should we do them one at a time? Because go ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead. And then you might so you remember. So we remember as well. <laughs> That's right. Um, okay. So the first question on uh, rights-based litigation. Um, you mentioned the nature of the people, and um, I think perhaps uh, I, will, I will I'll nuance my answer uh, about why it, it goes beyond, of course, having um, a right that is enshrined in the constitution. Um, in many of the countries where um, our climate, where these rights-based litigation is on the rise. Um, there is a, a strong tradition of constitutional litigation to advance environmental protection as well as the protection of socioeconomic rights. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a, it is a well-trodden path of using the courts to protect rights. And so it's not like it comes as a surprise that lots of the litigation, say in Brazil and Colombia and South Africa and India is rights-based. Um, on to the second question, um, the hypothesis we have here is that it's not quite unlike the trajectory we have seen in litigation in the developed countries. Vast majority of the litigation against uh, in, 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 in the developed countries has been against governments and, all, and many of the earlier cases based on tort law have not been successful. Recently, we have seen a little bit more a diversity in, in the pathways being pursued, such as using director's duties. Um, um, but you know, this is still very innovative and, 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 un, 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 and still ground to explore. What we think is going to happen in the global south is that you know, if depending on precedence and, and what, what, what happens through uh, the litigation happening in the developed countries, lessons can be learned and perhaps replicated. Is, just to follow up on that question, is one of the things you might have been getting at that um, even though it's a government that's behind the litigation, that they might be protecting corporate interests or there might be vested interests in that country that are getting tax breaks? Or I think there's like, is there a corporate story behind the government that's being... Ah. Oh, sorry, that, like, that was a really interesting response. But then I was thinking, is that... Is yeah. that the question? Yeah. Oh, okay. So No, no, that's, that's a great... Like it was checked. Reinterp yeah, re Reinterpretation. Re the question. No, that's brilliant. Um, <laughs> So that's actually a really interesting point yeah. because several of these climate uh, these carbon intensive projects uh, enjoy governmental support, right? Yeah, exactly. And um, the and across the world, uh, nine out of ten of the major oil and gas companies are state owned. Mm. Um, so by suing the government, it's using public law pathways. Well, if they try to use private law pathways to sue this entity, the government is behind it. The government is the majority shareholder or the dominant shareholder in several of these con uh, in several of these cases. I'm sorry, uh, several of these companies. So yes, that could be weird. That could be one pathway. Yes, kind of in interconnection between the government and the corporate kind of way of thinking about yeah the actors in this litigation. It's really interesting. Okay, next question. Right, we've got two questions down the front, and we've got some of our new students, three questions, some of our new students. So one, welcome, so nice to see you this evening. But one, and then, or, but one, of the, I think one at a time. I have two, but they are really, really, really short. Um, the first one was, I was wondering about the cause of action in Holcim, because I could see all sorts of issues around standing and like intertemporal or, you know, I mean, that, I was just wondering if you knew. And secondly, do you have a couple of examples of the incidental, that the motive-based um, causes of action? Okay, Thank sure. You. Thank you. Um, so first, uh, the first question on Holcim. I feel like I should know it, but I don't actually know which actual provision in the Swiss Civil Code they are relying on. I believe that they are relying on a provision that protects property rights. And while you might think of it as, are they actually act, acting extraterritorially, extra they actually try to go around it by saying that the damage um, was caused by, a con by the company that was domiciled in, the, in Switzerland. And it hasn't reached the stage of you know, 
interesting submissions on whether you can actually do that. Um, but yeah, that's basically as far as I'm cons I know at this moment, that's, that's what they are arguing. Um, on the second question, uh, incidental cases. So we actually came across many interesting incidental cases and unfortunately Jackie said they had to go to the footnotes because if I peppered them throughout the book, it would be too distracting. But the one that I really like is this case which uh, was decided in a religious court in Indonesia and um, the far this person the, uh, was an apple farmer and he cited climate change as a source of his financial difficulties and seeking um, some relief from having to pay alimony to his wife. And so climate change was, <laughs> was peppered through this judgment. And I really have to thank my, 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 my two research assistants who are Indonesian native speakers for finding these fabulous cases for me. Because one of them came to my office and said, I found this case, they were, it's brilliant. And I was like, what is the climate dimension there? It says climate change several times. And I was like, this is a good example of what an incidental case is. Uh, motive, um, we interviewed several um, actors um, and you know, through those interviews, we could therefore gather enough information about whether cases were being brought with the intention to um, be strategic climate litigation or to advance climate policy. Um, and, um, Unfortunately, I'm not able to really share the details, but we have we we, we do know of these cases happening. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Shout out, Gracia. Hi. I think some of uh, what I'm going to ask about may have been stuff that ends up in the ended up in the, your footnotes, but um, you mentioned around indigenous groups being uh, the claimants or. The, bringers of some of this litigation, but a lot of the rights that were being relied upon relating specifically to environmental issues. And I was wondering whether there was much experience of uh, Indigenous rights, sort of uh, cultural rights that were being relied upon, or whether those sorts of cases might have been coded out for motivation. Uh, no, if the, it, thank you very much for the question. And I, it was, I said no, because I was going to say they were not coded out. Um, Oftentimes, what we have seen is indigenous rights are not often protected in many constitutions. There are, very, there are few progressive constitutions that confer constitutional protection to in indigenous peoples. So what we often see is that indigenous peoples are relying on the constitutional rights that conferred on all citizens or on existing environmental laws that confer standing uh, on, 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 uh, to, to, to inhabitants. And that's what they rely on. Um, some of the jurisdictions like Indonesia have local laws, adult laws, that confer protection on the reckon, on indigenous peoples. And they rely on those local customary laws as the basis for arguing that they have not been properly consulted uh, before these um, um, you know, controversial projects or whatever have taken place. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, my question is a bit niche. Um, we're seeing a lot more cases like Vedanta of Parvi with big class action tort claims with Global South claimants, but anchoring to Global North defendants. What do you think are the pros and cons of those Global South claimants litigating in the Global North as opposed to trying to focus more on the domestic courts? That's a great question. <laughs> and, um, how many minutes do I have? Okay, so very, very briefly, um, there are the pros of it is, uh, or the cons of it. I think basically, first of all, there is always the concern that Global South claimants are not being included as, you know, to just lend legitimacy to a claim or to lend a Global South face to the claim. Okay, that's, that, that would be wrong. And that's something that's often a, a, something to guard against. When we spoke to several uh, in interviewees, that's something that they were very well aware of. So they, if, if there were such coalitions bringing cases in the global north, um, I think there is this understanding in the community that it has to be on the basis of a partnership and that they, uh, that they understand what is actually being advanced or ha ha happening. Um, first of all, the... In, in the global south, courts are often, um, not every global south jurisdiction has courts that are functional. 
So oftentimes, you might find that the Global South plaintiffs are going to the Global North courts because they cannot get redressed in their domestic courts. It might also be that in their home jurisdiction, they face harassment or danger. And environmental defenders face a, you know, significant uh, constraints uh, in, as well as physical danger in their home jurisdictions. So that's one reason that they would participate in this sort of litigation abroad. Um, secondly, is that um, if, if we look at certain projects that have been the subject of this sort of litigation, they're trying to go after what they call the major shareholders, right? So, and these the shareholders are, tend to be you know, com companies that operate or are global, south, uh, global north country, uh, uh, owned you know, by global north governments. Uh, a good example is the, um, uh, the multiple lawsuits surrounding the East Africa crude oil pipeline project. Right? So the Ugandan government is wholeheartedly uh, you know, invested in the project. Ugandan activists have all been shut down uh, and, and they, they are not going to be able to secure a remedy in the Ugandan courts. So that's when litigation on other fronts, including um, filing a case in the, um, in the regional human rights court, is what they're looking to. Mm -hmm. I've suddenly got lots of, four more and that's it. One, two, three, four. Great. We might take two at a time now. Mindful of the clock. Sorry. Thank you so much, and congrats to you and Jackie on submitting the manuscript. My question is very short. It's um, just about the uh, what you spoke about in terms of a remedial creativity or flexibility um, in terms of the continuing mandamus in the Pakistan context. Um, and I suppose the lessons that can be drawn from that, but also the dangers, because I think in some other contexts, for example, climate protests in the north, in particular, permanent injunctions um, against trespass or against um, organizing are, you know, a real um, democratic concern. So, mm -hmm. just what your thoughts were on that front? Great, great question. I'm going to take two, yeah, two at a time. So, come down the front. Yep. Okay. No, sorry. You're next. Here. <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. So, mine. Um, what mine was linked to the point about the potential growth in the global south and linked to sort of cases seeking accountability on corporates. It's kind of a question and it which is like it relies on increase sorry, let me rephrase it. It relies on better quality of uh, attribution science. Mm -hmm. Right? And then to what extent that is sort of Evolving as fast as these cases. I have a second question, but that's linked to the point that you made. If you can elaborate more about so the example of strategic litigation, right? Even if you lose the case, you actually change the outcome. Well, a different kind of outcome. So, because I think this is why we do climate litigation. It's like I'm not sure you're gonna we're gonna achieve all the climate action case by case. The question is the multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Short answers. Short answers. Um, the first Big one question. was on. No, I've lost it. Actually, no, uh, but oh, remedies. Remedies. Okay. Particularly continuing ones that might undermine democracy. Thank you. Yeah. See, that's the good tutor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Eloise. Um, so the short answer to that: the Pakistani experience has to be understood in uh, in in the context of the um, Indian subcontinent's experience with. Uh, the courts playing a very activist role. Um, the Pakistani jurisprudence is very heavily influenced by the Indian jurisprudence, which um, has basically been like super powered judicial activism, which uh, would raise big eyebrows of, of, of judicial activism elsewhere uh, of, over, of overreach. There is big concerns of that constitutionally. Um, the, and that's a, actually a really interesting point. I'll, I'll just raise two things. One is that Pakistani judges justify their activism and the use of a continuing bandwidth because they think that they are the only institution that can be relied upon to act. That's basically it. That's what Judge Mansur Ali Shah would say. Mm -hmm. 
Related to that, however, are people who argue that by doing so, it continues to enfeeble the executive, because the executive is always going to be like, okay, bring the litigation on, and then I will know what to do. Mm. And that's when we have empirical, you know, we know that is happening in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh as well as in India. So that's the problems with that. Um, attribution science. Attribution science. Yeah. Attribution science has developed tremendously, but a lot more has to be done with regards to the in, the the carbon footprint of companies in the global south, right? Like the meat industry in Brazil, the forestry industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That would be really interesting, and that's what I think the next level of of attribution science should be. The second example, or the second question on strategic climate litigation. I thought when in my discussions with Indonesian civil society, so briefly, they've brought several cases which have, where the courts have found the government to be negligent of um, environmental, uh, negligent in the uh, enforcement of environmental laws and therefore contributing to climate change. But these judgments have been ignored by the government. And, but when you but when we talk to you know, the various actors, whether it was the prosecutors and the lawyers and to the community, we found that these cases did change mindsets. The, and also the lawyers that failed, effect, effectively failed, they actually said, no, we actually learned a lot and now we can bring the next case even better, even faster. And so that was actually really interesting. Mm. Fantastic. Two last questions and then you'll have really earned a refreshment. Yes. <sighs> Hi, um, hi, Julie. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so my question is, when you were going through these cases in the global south, did you find that maybe there was a hesitancy on the part of the courts in the global south against maybe a finding against, um, you know, fossil fuel companies, all that who may be polluting the environment or the climate in the global south? Because we know that countries in the global south, they are much more dependent on Western companies or investors in their area for economic development. So do you find that maybe the courts are a lot more hesitant in finding against them as opposed to courts in the Western region? Great. And last question. Thank you so much for your talk. It was illuminate, illuminating. What would be your analysis on cases where um, transnational companies are exploiting uh, critical minerals for an energy transition mm -hmm. so and at the same time are causing environmental damage in the global south mm -hmm. thank you um, so great questions thank you the first one um, there will there are judge there there have been cases where the judges ignore the climate change arguments and decide on purely, you know, very, very doctrinal issues because they don't want to proceed with the case. And there are also cases where you can see that the judges are very sympathetic to um, arguments that, that, um, that, are, that favor economic development at the expense of environmental protection or climate change action. So you ha we, have, we see that. Um, it, we can't see clear lines. It might just be that it's, I mean, as we can't say this leads to that, but we do, we, we have seen cases like this because um, as, you, as you mentioned, the heavy reliance on, West, uh, on, on Western or developed country, uh, foreign direct investment is, is, is significant in several of these countries. But we also see several cases where the judges see themselves as vanguards of um, their social resources, and that includes the environment. Um, that's a great question. Um, the, there is currently quite a lot of litigation um, in the Atacama, where, which is where uh, you're from there. It's a, it's a, it's, I've never been there. It's supposed to be a very beautiful place. And lithium mining is now undermining the fragility of the fragile environment in the Atacama. And um, it's a tough one because it's a national strategic priority. Um, and this the, the cases that have been filed have been not against the corporations, but against the government policies that allow the extraction at such a rapid rate of the lithium resource. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to say first of all thank you to the audience because they were really great questions, mm -hmm. and it was fantastic to hear. I get a, I get a, get a bit of your experience and your perspective. So, thank you to all of you. <laughs>
obviously the biggest thank you to Jolene. Oh, thank um, you. But not only was that a wonderful presentation, extremely generous to share with us, but you did a lot of that research in times where it wasn't easy to travel and mm -hmm. discovered all this about all parts of the world. I think that's just phenomenal. Incredible. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you.